All right, everybody. Have a good morning. I appreciate everybody participating today. We've got some faces online. Uh, Ernie reminded us the authority to do virtual. When does that end, Ernie? Do you know? July 1st. Okay. Um, so appreciate everybody being involved again. Uh, we've got an agenda here to go through. Hopefully everybody's had a, a chance to look at it a little bit. Maybe do some pre-thought, um, trying to engage everybody and learn some new things about um, about some of our uh, solid waste districts as well. So with that, we can, we'll get started. Oh my gosh, Matt's not here to do it. <laughs> here. You started off so strong. Uh, well, Michael Deneen. Here. Steve Sargent. Here. Kimberly McConville. Here. John Daly. I know he's not done. Paul Wise. Here. Marcy Cross. Here. Beth Biggins Raymer. Here. Jennifer Fenderbosch. Here. Alex Bernke. And I know he's not coming. Brian Winter. Here. Matthew Old. Here. And Chuck Bianca. Here. Kelly Benzman. Here. Here. I think that's everybody. And we have a quorum. Thank you, sir. Uh, administrative business. Oh, yes, that would be me too. Um, <laughs> so first off, I just we've got Vlad Sika here, who's our division chief, and he is retiring at the end of next week. And he just came to say goodbye to everybody. He's exiting public servitude. Sir, is that the word for it? It's probably not. Like, uh, okay. Is that not a anymore? <laughs> and we've been waiting for this day for a very long time. Yes, so yes, I'm sure you have. We're going to miss Vlad in a big way. So, are you retiring completely, or are you just retiring from this? Um, no, yeah, for for a little while, I'll retire completely. But uh, who knows what what door, doors will open in a year or so? But I did wanted to uh, you know come in person and just say. Hi, thank you. It's been um, a pleasure. We've had a lot of really good conversations. We may not have agreed on everything, but um, I think collectively we've done a lot of good work for Ohio uh, on lots of fronts. So I just wanted to thank everyone for, for their participation and their continued, their continued efforts. In, in you know engaging with us and hopefully this will continue far into the future so i want to say thanks for everyone and it's been re a real pleasure when i started with the agency vlad and i were at the same work level mm -hmm. and now you can see i have not my ambition has carried me well whereas <laughs> i'm still not in the supervising <laughs> level and vlad rose way to the top so i didn't want to but yeah That's yeah, it. Okay. Um, <laughs> so sending out to solid waste districts. It's part of um, our effort to try to put out more communication between us and the solid waste districts. All MAC members are on the list to receive the newsletter at this point. If you do not want to be on the distribution list, we can take you off of it. Uh, we're hoping to issue that first letter newsletter sometime this month still. Um, we've had, as you can imagine, with uh, oversight and everything, it's taken a little bit of a while to come out soon. Last time we were supposed to introduce our new planner. His name was Ryan Borgart. He came from the Environmental Education Fund at EPA. And now I'm going to say goodbye to him because he has taken a job in Chicago to go be closer to his family. So I apologize, but you didn't get the chance to meet him last time. Um, but we're, if I was in his position, I would do the same thing. Would we have him for like, what, two months? It's longer than that. Yeah, came on in January. Right. Ryan. Kevin Zacharias is on position. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then Aswato is going to be doing a training on writing solid waste plans on May 4th, just as in, in case anybody has a solid waste district that you know that would be interested in that. And then the drop off anti contamination project that we've been working on, Matt is not here, so he gave me a few talking points just to go over to give you an update. So the subcommittee for MAC met twice. 
uh, the meetings included not just the representatives from MAC who were on it, but also Recycling and Litter Prevention, the Recycling Partnership, and then also our grant writer who was um, Jim Sporo. The, we've reviewed and updated the draft application for the project. I think we've settled on a final, a final application for it. And there have been discussions among, in, amongst the subcommittee about how many households we can reach using the proposed budget that we have. Um, establishing, you know, how to educate households for drop-offs because with curbside it's much easier because you know who you're educating to. With drop-offs it's a different type of audience because you don't really know who's using it. Um, and then establishing potential applicants. So we have a preference on rural, but we're not doing that exclusively. If you remember in the state plan, uh, one of the objectives that we had was to focus more on rural drop-offs to help them with their contamination. So that's our preference, but we're not being exclusive. And then we're waiting to see the results um, of the controlling board on April 25th to see if there's gonna be funding available. So we'll know shortly whether or not that's something we'll be able to move forward. And I think um, that's all all the updates I have. Um, I, if you want to do the minutes. Two questions. Sure. Do that. Uh, Matt's not here. Somebody take minutes. Yes, today. Ryan. We, Ryan is. Okay. It's his last, you know, rather than doing the hazing, we're doing it at the <laughs> end. So. Got it. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate that. Um, You're welcome. The, There's uh, Ryan. Oh, there he is. Ryan, we hardly knew you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, minutes. Everybody review the minutes. Michael, I move we approve the February 16th, 2022 meeting minutes as presented. Thank you. Any discussion? All opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Um, sorry, I was just making a note here. Um, so that takes care of all the business that we had. Um, we can get go on and get started on our agenda. We have a standing and agenda item for the Recycling and Litter Prevention Grant Program just to give us an update as where we are. And so we have April Stevens, who's the supervisor of the unit, to just give us a quick update on where we are with the program. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I couldn't uh, join you in person uh, this time. I had another meeting that, that bumped right up to 10, so I, I couldn't make it downtown in time. So, um, but I'm gonna attempt to do this remotely. Can um, can you see my PowerPoint? Is it up? Fantastic, okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna give a, a quick update um, on the grant program and then also on the, um, the recommendations from the subcommittee um, on, on the grant program that uh, we went over last time as well. So, um, again, I know I know I shared these last time in February, but again, this was um, our applications that we got in the 2022 grant round. Uh, we got a total of 103 applications um, for just over seven and a half million dollars. And you can see the the break up there as usual. It's the majority of them were in the community litter. Um, we got a handful in the other three categories as well. The other three categories had big dollar amount projects, though. Um, so as um, Ernie mentioned, um, we, we are going to controlling board. So um, from the previous slide, the current ask is seven and a half million for the grant program, um, but our current spending authority um, for that fund is only four and a half million. Um, so we are on the agenda for April 25th. We are asking for an additional two million. Um, that'll cover um, anticipated um, grants and then as well as the um, the drop off contam contamination project if we move forward with that. So we we included that in there. Um, we went with 2 million to kind of cover the um, the other half of the 4 million that we didn't spend in 2020. So um, we felt like we weren't asking for more money. We were just asking to spend the money that we couldn't spend. So um, so that'll give us about six and a half million to spend. Um, again, you know, some of that will come out for the, the, um, the drop off contamination project potentially. And you know we we will not be funding all of the grants. There were quite a few that um, were not either not eligible, um, had ineligible things in them, or just weren't ready and just weren't weren't good projects. So um, I don't anticipating us spending six and a half on grants, um, uh, but we'll we'll know that answer. Um, actually, that's the next slide. Um, the next slide on the timeline. So we will prevent present our suggested um, applicants to Director Stevenson um, early next month. Um, so we're we're going through the compliance check process right now um, to make sure that all the ones that that we did identify as good scores um, don't have any compliance issues. So um, we'll have that done uh, hopefully the end of this week or early next week. 
and then we'll put our, our final recommendations together, present those to the director, um, then we'll make that funding announcement in late May. First for our grantees, um, and then we're already looking at next cycle. Um, so that opens November 7th, and we'll close on February 3rd of next year. And then um, following up, um, we have been making some progress on those um, the recommendations um, for Director Stevenson on the grant program um, that you guys um, presented with us late last year. And I know I, I presented um, kind of our action plan at the last meeting. Um, so just to give an update on where we are with that, um, we sent a survey out to past government sponsors to gather some feedback um, and every single one of them responded. Um, Marcy was one of them. Thank you so much for that. Um, but we were so thrilled that everybody gave us feedback, everybody responded. So we are using that information to put together um, a, an FAQ kind of guidance document um, that we'll have available for this year's um, government sponsors um, for this, this round of, of grants. Um, and then we're also kind of gathering, you know, some some mentors and, you know, getting, you know, hopefully getting some commitments um, to some of those past sponsors that can do a little bit more handholding as well if needed um, to help the new the new sponsors. We do have a few this year, um, people that have never worked through the program. So, you know, lining up a, a you know, a small half a dozen of of those that can provide some more assistance um, through the process of those um, sub agreements, sub grant agreements. Um, resolutions and those types of things that may have to happen um, for them to be able to be sponsors and to work with um, the businesses that they're sponsoring. And then with that, that was the one recommendation was um, the government sponsor. And then the other one um, was outreach um, to get new applicants. Um, we've been doing a lot of work. Um, Jessica Daldal is, is on the meeting um, remotely today. Um, she's been with the um, office for about six months and we kind of gave Gave her the Ohio Materials Marketplace and said, make this better. And she's been doing a fantastic job. And she's been outreaching to some associations to gather interest for um, the material marketplace, but in but also, you know, promoting our grant program as well. So I put a list of some of the the um, entities that she's been meeting with, um, the Ohio Manufacturing Association, um, and I think the Ohio Chemical Technology Council are both going to be um, um, advertising um, our our services in their newsletters um, for Material Marketplace and with the grant program. And we will continue to um, develop those relationships and make sure that they're outreaching to their members. Um, I think we're gonna do a little presentation to um, the women in manufacturing um, at a lunch and learn uh, here in a month or two. Um, and, you know, again, th these are, we're starting with the Materials Marketplace because we wanna bump that up, but then we're also promoting the grant program through it. So we're gonna be reaching new, um, a lot of new audiences that way. And then we've also started um, doing a monthly newsletter for OM as well. And so once, you know, further on, you know, late summer, we'll start marketing the grant program that way too. That goes out to 1300 people um, who might not be getting um, communication from us other ways. So this will be, you know, a new way for us to, um, to market the grant program. And again, as always, if you have any other suggestions of, of ways we can get in front of new audiences, um, we are always happy to hear those. Um, and just here's me. And if you have any questions about the, the grant program, you can always reach out to me or uh, Marie. I think she, she's on the call as well today. Um, so you can always reach out to us with um, any questions. April, I just want to make a comment. As uh, Genoa Township was a recipient of the grant last year, and through the grant, we were able to reduce a lot of litter in our community because we were having issues with blowout of the red bins, et cetera. And we were able to grant uh, 1,317 residents the, uh, the totes, uh, the 65 gallon totes. It became such a clicky thing and so popular. We had a roar of people wanting them as, you know, because they look so beautiful with the EPA logo on them and everything. So we have we have a, a full price sale going on right now to residents, and so far we've sold about 250 more of those so at regular price. So it's popular, and I thank the EPA for that grant. Really glad that it was successful, and even more than you thought. And I apologize, my dogs are. I have the door closed, but they're freaking out on something. So I apologize if you can hear my dog. I, I think the mailman must have come or something. It's there's a threat on the porch, apparently. Does anybody have other questions for April? Uh, April, I'll ask two things. Number one, 
Uh, you talked about the um, grants program, the grant cycle, and thinking about next year, and you've got some recommendations and that kind of thing. Um, I guess this is more of a statement than anything else. Please make sure that if you need additional time uh, in your standing, whatever, we talk about that so we can get that scheduled here at the end of the year to try to help you as much as we can going forward. Um, the other thing was, I don't know if anybody's talked to you, but it did come up in our agenda planning meeting. Uh, the materials management or materials marketplace um, came up because we talked about that a long time ago uh, when we first kind of came together as one of those things. I think that kind of put together at the same time. Um, as we go forward with this, it might be a, an opportunity to talk about that a little bit more um, with private sector representation we have here to figure out experiences and, and try to help that out going forward uh, and utilize the asset to the best of its ability. That would be fantastic. We are we are actively working on ways to make that better and bigger and, and work better. Um, so yeah, we would love that. Yeah, I think that's great. Ernie, maybe you can help us get a, another meeting set up to um, to meet again with a, the subgroup on the grants. So we once we get it's you know we don't we never the grant program never sleeps. Uh, the minute we um, we announce grants, we're then we jump right into then the next um, the next grant round. So um, maybe in sometime in June or July would be a great time to get together and start talking about that. So if we do. Um, if we do decide to make any adjustments that that have to affect the um, the online application, then we can work that into the process because that does take a few months to make any changes to the the portal. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, April. So next on the agenda, we have Michelle Mountjoy, who's our division's rules coordinator. She's just going to give you a quick update on where we stand with rule rules in our division. Michelle, are you there? I'm here. Thanks, Ernie. Uh, so I have a quick update, like Ernie said. I'll, I'm going to hit the most popular rules in our division right now. So those being, first of all, Ernie's fee rules. So those went out for interested party um, a month or two ago, and we are slowly but but making progress getting to a stage where we want to file those rules with the Joint Committee on Agency Rule Review, or JCAR. Uh, so thank you for everyone who submitted comments on those. We actually um, got more comments on the fee rules than we have in the past, and it it helped us to evaluate the program and see where it's helping you and where it's, it's not clear. And so we tried to make as many improvements as we could. Also, uh, this week on Monday, the CNDD processing facility rules for the third party facilities that's uh, we call them standalone facilities. They aren't associated with the landfill. Those rules went effective. So they are on the books and we will be having a lot of facilities coming through that will be needing permits and licenses. So um, we're going to be working on a lot of outreach there to make sure everyone understands how to implement this new program. <clears throat> The other half of those rules is the processing facilities that are associated with landfills. Those rules are um, were separated and they are a little behind on, at least not on the same track. So those rules are going to be filed with JCAR. Actually, that happened yesterday. They were filed with JCAR. And uh, if you got a listserv notice from us, the first email message we sent, uh, the link was bad for some reason. So we do apologize for that. And this morning, a new message was sent out with the link. Um, our rules are always on our web page, though. So if you ever get a, a message and it has a link that's not working, um, you can definitely reach out to us. But also the, the rules should be available on our website and and they are there for your review. We'll have a public hearing on those rules in May, May 25th. <clears throat> Other than that, we still have a lot of projects that we're working on as a division. Uh, we have uh, scrap tire rules that we're still working on to try to get out to interested parties. And we have some solid waste operations rules that we're looking at working through as well. But um, I won't go into detail on those unless you have a favorite that you want more explanation on. So let me know if you have any questions or you can always shoot me an email. Yes, we have a question, Beth. Um, okay. the, the standalone rules, will you be doing any like FAQ sheets or, you know, kind of cliff notes that you usually do in conjunction with those rules? Yes, that's a great question. Um, 
We do have our c and unit. They are putting together a couple of things. One, a question sheet like you asked for, we call that guidance. Um, so we will have some guidance documents that we're going to be posting soon. Uh, we did want those to go out with the rules, but, um, and, you know, best intentions. But we also plan to have some training. So that, that we're hoping will be widely participated because that will be a, a more in-depth overview of the rules and a, an opportunity to ask questions. Okay, great. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have questions for Michelle? Glad you don't want to grill her. Okay. <laughs> He'll do that Thank later. You, Bye. Bye. Thank I'll, you. I'll do it later. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Uh, next up on our agenda, we have um, Susan Escobi from US EPA, who's going to give us an overview of the US EPA circular economy and a couple of the uh, grant programs that were adopted through the, the unit. Susan will tell you what they I are. I know, right? It's Acron a mouthful. <laughs> There's a lot of acronyms, and I don't know what they mean. So I know, and we, we've changed them over time, too. So uh, I want to say thanks, everybody, for letting me join the meeting, and congratulations, Vlad, on your retirement. I know I think I'm going to speak for us all since I'm the person here to say I know we're going to be sad that you're leaving. Um, so as Ernie, thanks, Ernie, too, for letting me uh, speak to you guys. Um, I want to talk about, let me, I'm going to share a presentation. Let me see here. Uh, hopefully, I haven't been the person who's on the outside coming into meetings. So hopefully this works. Does that look, how's that look? Uh, anybody who's looking at it looks good. All right. So I just want to say, so uh, today I want to talk a little bit about um, some of our upcoming grant programs uh, that were created under the Infrastructure Investment in Jobs Act. And that's evolved how we've called it over time too. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about that and see if we can get some feedback because that's what we're uh, working on now. All these, this money has been assigned to these grant programs. We're starting to develop them and we're taking feedback from our states, our uh, stakeholders across the regions. And because there's certain elements that there's a little bit of a design sort of going into this. So just trying to get uh, your feedback uh, on some of the main topics and themes, if we can do that. I I think it seems like this will be easy with this group. Um, people like to talk and and we have opinions, so that's good. Um, I just wanna say, we're so we're taking some notes today. My uh, colleague, Jessica Schumacher is on the call and she's gonna take a couple of notes. And then our idea is we'll take those, uh, hi Jessica, we'll take some of these notes and like I said, help develop these uh, RFAs that we hope to release in the fall. Um, and that's all I have on that about kind of the timeline. So just some background, uh, many of you probably know we had our national recycling strategy uh, that was released uh, last year in kind of its final form, uh, part one of a several parts uh, strategies looking at um, folk focusing on enhancing uh, the national municipal solid waste or household recycling system. And it really identifies actions, stakeholder-led actions to create a stronger, more resilient, more equitable, and more cost-effective municipal solid uh, waste recycling system. And while we acknowledge that recycling alone can't uh, help us achieve a circular economy, kind of there's a lot of steps forward we can take um, at, that, at those levels. And, um, so what you see on the website right now, the part one strategy is just part one. In the future, over 10 years, we hope to create uh, additional strategies for additional materials. But these are the kind of the general objectives that we all know and love um, as part of, uh, you know, what we do and when it comes to recycling and kind of the challenges and kind of what, what you know, the overall work we, we do. Um, so some of the background, um, on the Swiffer, that's solid waste for infrastructure. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, solid waste infrastructure for recycling program grant program Swiffer. I'll call it Swiffer, and the Consumer Recycling Education and Outreach Program CREO. These are two separate programs. They have fairly similar elements, but kind of attack, um, you know, the recycling systems. How do you know? Try to make them more efficient, more equitable in different manners. Um, so, Swiffer. Um, is implemented under the plastic strategy of the Save Our Seas uh, 2.0 Act. Uh, it, that came out a couple of years ago, but there was no funding behind it. So now with the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, there's going to be funding behind it. 
Um, what we hope to do with this is to support improvements to local post-consumer materials management, including municipal re uh, recycling programs, and assist local waste management authorities in improving uh, local waste management systems. So that's kind of, you know, big overall goals. Um, the funding is $275 million for five years. So that's a $55 million per year over the next five years until expended. So how that's going to be um Expended is going to, you know, still kind of in question, but uh, that's what we have. It's a, quite a bit. Um, so for our information today, uh, the en eligible entities under this grant program are going to be uh, states, uh, tribes, uh, District of Columbia, territories, and then also subdivisions of uh, states, that, you know, defined by the uh the uh, Save Our Seas 2.0 Act. So if you are considering, if you might be an eligible entity, you can you know, kind of look over that, but it's going to be subdivisions of states and states, um, not nonprofits, not uh, inst institutions that I know of, but I think that's being more defined. Uh, so that's the SWIFR program. The other program that's uh, funded under the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is the CREO program um, that's uh, a little less funding, $75 million over five years. So about $15 million per year. Again, still working on how that's going to look uh, in the end. Awarded through uh, competitive annual allocations. That's meant to implement public education and outreach activities uh, for recycling and improve residential and community recycling programs. Uh, this is different from the SWIFR. There's going to be a uh, Eligible entities include non uh, nonprofits and private public partnerships. So again, maybe some more of the folks in this room, virtual room, um, you know, might fit under this versus Swiffer. So under this uh, this program, the actions are uh, the grant. The applicants should be informing the public about recycling programs, uh, communicating what's accepted in recycling programs and also trying to decrease uh, decrease contamination and increase collection rates. So this can include, there's a longer list than this, but uh, to keep it kind of short, that's gonna include like public service announcements, door-to-door -door, um, campaigns, social media, uh, different types of outreach in those sort of, that sort of sense. And, um, and then additional outreach activities as determined by the administrator. So I think you can, there's a, a large variety of uh, options. They're all listed out in the um, the CREO grant, uh, the CREO language. Uh, at, so if you want more details, but it's, you know, kind of what you would do for outreach. So that was a lot at once. I could take some specific questions on this. Um, again, I don't know much more detail than these things. We have not finalized a lot of stuff yet. We're like, like getting uh, input from you. And so that's what I'd like to do right now. If we have a short discussion, because you're the stakeholders we really need to hear from. Um, just trying to take in that information and bring it to the RFA. And we have some th kind of three main themes, I think, that we're trying to get information on how to effectively address disadvantaged communities. Um, that's, you know, baked into both grant programs as a, a very important portion of the uh, what we hope applicants will address. Um, how to measure um, your success and also what's the, some of the most impactful things that we could be funding as part of these programs. Um, so I'm going to, let me see if, so this is the question portion. So Ernie, is it okay? Can we have like a back and forth? Does that work how we're talking like this? Okay, I see. Um, and then cut me off maybe if I'm talking too long. So, uh, or if we have too much of a conversation. So I'd like, if you if you want to um, give some input uh, and also if you could identify yourself, if you're gonna speak so we know who's talking or maybe kind of your perspective. We'd like to know, um, like I said, for both of the grant programs, we're looking at how we can, uh, you know, most uh, support our disadvantaged communities. And we are wondering if your organization is addressing disadvantaged communities and how you, you know, how you do your waste management program. Because again, I know there's a lot of different entities here, how you are, uh, you know, working in that sphere or how you're doing it via education and outreach. And what's been the most successful for you and what's been challenges? 
I see. A, I, I know I see a hand raise. I, and also, if you want to raise your hand in the uh, teams, because I can see that, too. I see Jennifer is raising her hand because <laughs> she's on camera. Hi there. Um, I'm Jennifer Finnerbosch, and I represent the municipalities. And I just need to have a clarity of definition. Um, going back to the SWIFR, the SWIFR, sure. um, you stated that there were going to be um, – that the subdivisions of states, does that include municipalities or yes. is that the regional purchasing um, districts that the state creates? That's a good question. So what regional purchasing district, is that that's yes. different so, from a municipality? Yes. So, for example, um, there is uh, NOACA, which is a group of of communities around Cleveland. And the, the federal government gives money to the state, the state gives it to NOACA, and NOACA then, um, they approve the grants and they dish them out to whoever applies if they are applicable. Or the state can um, directly give the money to subdivisions. Could be townships, could be uh, municipalities, but I need to know what the federal definition is if municipalities and townships apply directly to the state or through their um, purchasing district. So that's a good question. So, so for some of the, so we're still mm -hmm. developing some of the grant program um, kind of based on like what will be competitive and maybe what's going to be a baked kind of, uh, if there's going to be like those two different kinds of programs, like competitive or um, non-competitive uh, for states. So as my understanding goes right now, that you the municipality would be able to apply directly to uh, federal, for these some of these federal funds, some of them. Um, NOACA, so can you tell me like what's the, I might have to go back and ask about that because I agree it's kind of confusing once you get to, there's so many different, you know, uh, entities for states. So what's the what's the term NOACA so I can take that back to headquarters okay. so they can consider that? I'm sorry, that. I don't have the exact. It's, it's Northern <laughs> Ohio Agency of Communities for Purchasing. or okay. Every district in Ohio has one of those regions, those district regions. Sometimes federal grants, municipalities have to go through their district. Sometimes I municipalities see. go directly to the federal government. Sometimes municipalities go directly to the state. So the answer to if municipalities and townships can apply directly and counties, okay, because they're a subdivision, right? then yep. how will they know that the grant is even available to apply for? I think that's really important to how they will be notified. Okay. Um, and I, from my understanding, municipalities and cities and uh, I, other subdivisions of states, you know, but that's a good question. So let me, let me um, ask about, because I see what you're saying is like that, that's the entity that gets the money and that's the entity that distributes the money. Sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes. sometimes, in some cases. So, right, okay. sometimes. So the federal government sometimes gives it directly to municipalities. If a municipality knows about it, they can apply directly. So where we're at, it would be to Chicago, right? So um, to the regional district. Other times we have to apply through our, our purchasing district, which where I'm located in northern Ohio, it would be the other regional applied through the state. But the, the main thing is how would municipalities, townships, and counties know about the grants and the deadlines and the what uh, qualifications they would have to sure. apply toward? Well, that's why that's one thing where we're trying to do um, some of this outreach, but also, you know, that's going to be on the public. And I know that's you're like, well, how are they going to know still? We have, you know, our newsletters. I know we're we're trying our best to get the information out. So um, but let me take your question. And also, I also say that if we can't figure that out now, there's going to be a request for information on some of these programs. And if that's uh, that sounds like a very important question for people at the top that might not realize, you know, we get it gets in the weeds uh, when we get to different governments. So uh, request for information on both these grant programs will be coming out, I believe, in the next two weeks. And so you can put comments there, but also I'm taking the comments today to bring to uh, our headquarters office. So thank you. Sorry, I can't answer that directly, like quite as well. No, as no further like. questions. Thank you very much. Okay. So Ed, again, is there a, uh, so if we want to talk about disadvantaged communities, um, if there's anything folks on this 
meeting would like to say how you approach uh, working with those communities and specific needs or challenges. Or not, we can also move to the next question or you can send that directly to me or send it to the RFI. Um, that'll be public in a few weeks. This is Mike Deneen. I'd like to build on Jennifer's question because the the question that, that presents itself to me is what is your goal with the program? And I mean a 30,000 or a 50,000 foot goal. Are you planning on funding specific projects from locals direct granting? Or would this be something that could utilize existing conduits that are already out there in the granting program like we had here? So could the state of Ohio go in and say we would like to add a million dollars to our um, grant program that April's in charge of that you kind of might have heard, I don't know, when you got on the call. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we have already have the um, success stories that we've had. We have a grant program that's already set up. We already get to municipalities. We can specify that that material or that, that dollar value go to specific programs. Uh, they could specify, I talked about disadvantaged communities. There's a matching section in that. Maybe the matching section gets matched by the federal government rather than by the local community if you're a disadvantaged community. We already have conduits there that you could basically turn on right now. The difference is you have to fund that without knowing what the final product was going to be. So the question again becomes, is your plan to create your own system completely or utilize the existing infrastructure that a state may want to use in that way? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I think, so for my understanding right now is some of it's going to be stag funding, like the kind of the baked in funding. And then there's also the competitive portion. So maybe, and I'm not working directly on that end of it. So I don't know how much it is. I don't know what that looks like. I've never worked kind of in that area before. I've mostly done competitive programs. So how that, you know, what you're allowed to do with that and how that is awarded is not my expertise. But I think that would, that seems like something more on that other side of the, the the program. Does that sound does that sound good? Because I, I get what you're saying. Like you got these programs, you already are making it happen, and you just need more funding to, uh, you know, keep it moving. So, uh, one of our other members has another comment too. But I think what you're the idea of being competitive. I don't necessarily know that you couldn't be competitive with what the state already can do. You could go in and say. This is what we've accomplished before. You give us more funding, we're going to accomplish this. Um, so we yeah. have a track record, which you may not get in an individual project that says, hey, we're, we think we might be able to accomplish this. We know we've accomplished this for, Chet, help me out, how many years now? Uh, we started the grant program in 80, 80, 82. So for the last 50 years, we've had a grant program that's been successful that we can point to that says we're competitive. So. Compliment Michael's comment is a, a lot of states as Ohio, they have a state's always plan that sets these goals and, a, you know, a, a format for kind of under the state plan. Then there are these, these entities, these, you know, political subdivisions called solid waste districts who then write plans that actually put, you know, the the boots on the ground to make these activities happen. So in Ohio, and, and I know Ohio is not alone in having this kind of infrastructure of, of goals and then, you know, processes for actually getting those goals implemented. So I, I would echo, um, you know, Michael's comments that, you know, you may want to you know funnel it to these organizations that have a track record of managing those funds and um you know if it's a if it's a new goal of really focusing on plastics diversion and, and this this comment does knit to the the other side of your programming here so uh, i think utilize what's there would probably be best for all i mean we have you may have heard it we've got a contamination reduction program we did a first phase, if you will, it's been completed. We're in the middle of starting another one using the grant program that we're su suggesting. And it's all about education, training, working with community partnerships. Everything that you're saying, all the boxes. Yeah. we're already yeah. doing. 
So yeah. if we have limited funding, we can do more with additional funding if that's what your goal is. Um, mm -hmm. And I think your outreach program becomes much simpler when you're talking about that because it's already there. And, it, and it's tried and true. I mean, this is, this is rigorously um, evaluated and I think it ticks the box on how, how you measure success. So I, I would also not wanna see just one city in Ohio take the bulk of the funding. I think that would be a missed opportunity to use the expertise that we have here at Ohio EPA. And I say that as a private sector stakeholder. So I don't say that lightly. Um, people love to kind of complain about government agencies, but this is one that is highly functional, highly collaborative. So I, I think that is a very strong roadmap. And that's all great. You know, they, this is all great points. I'm just, so not, this is not only going to be, um, like I said, competitive in terms of like, uh, it, it, there's going to be a, like some of the funds are going to be awarded, I believe, directly to states. And I just don't know that. But that's a great point because I think Ohio is kind of ahead of the curve, especially in in kind of some of the in our you know region in terms of giving out these these grants and managing them. And I know it, it's a little burdensome there as well, uh, kind of to to be managing all this. But I think that's a great point to point out that this is a good, sorry, a good partner to work with and to uh, continue some of the work they're already doing. Um, but but again, it's not, this. Is, the competitive side is not, that's not all the, I'm not sure how it's separated right now, um, but there will be, as I understand it, a non, like the state allocations like STAG. So, so, Susan, this is Chet Cheney. I, I think that we, and I don't speak on behalf of, this is my personal opinion, not, not the agency's opinion. Vlad can say what he wants to say about the agency. So, um, you know, we've talked internally about this money and, and, you know, we don't, as a state, we don't want to get in a position of competing with local government um, or the private sector in that regard. Well, I think what what I'm hearing from members of the Materials Management Advisory Council is that there is a, a structure in place, um, both solid waste districts, counties, municipalities, townships, um, but solid waste districts kind of bind them together a little bit because they have their local solid waste plans. We have a state solid waste plan that gives guidance as well. Uh, and we have a grant program, and some of our solid waste districts have their own grant programs. And so um, I'm just hopeful that US EPA, when they're putting together the grant program, that they take that into account, uh, that perhaps they use the structure in place to allow for that funding to be funneled through um, those systems so that it can be directed towards uh, entities that know what's going on on the ground. They have boots on the ground. They know the issues. And uh, so I think that um, it would be uh the federal government to kind of look at that structure to see whether or not uh, that that can be to your advantage if you're funneling that money. Um, it is, you know, there've been a lot of great things that have happened, uh, but it's been in partnership. With, with the local government, many times with the private sector as well. Uh, so there's a lot going on and, and hopefully you can make sure that that money is kind of directed um, in, through the systems that are in place. That's a great, that's great. Uh, real quickly, we had a comment um, from Rob Ryder here, who's gonna be speaking to Twist later and he just wanted to point out has never been politically motivated, so um, that there's not that issue to to worry about. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, Susan, I, if if you would like something, and we can as a group comment on that, and maybe it would make take some more weight um, with your comment period. But I don't know if you know the background of this group and its its composition is not just governmental agencies; it is. Um, private enterprises, haulers, yeah. Yeah. just standard private businesses, um, large businesses, associations, 
we have a wide group here. Um, and I would venture to say without speaking for everyone else that we could have a unanimous support letter done out of this group um, suggesting that you do that this way uh, and that that be the most beneficial way to distribute that funding if there's that type of organization or that type of desire done. I mean, we could okay. do, Ohio EPA could apply for something with the support of local private enterprises, the state communities, uh, the Solid Waste Management Association of Ohio. I mean, we could put together a, a grant proposal from a statewide level and then let it figure out what it's going to do at a future date. So um, okay. Okay. if you could let staff, EPA staff know um, how we do that or where that would be, when and where that would be appropriate, we can try to make that happen. Yeah, let me, yeah. Um, I, I think this is all, it's, this is all interesting. This, um, again, the kind of competitive side I know is going to be different than uh, say uh, at the state allocation sort of sense, but I get what you're saying is just that you have the, you have the uh, levers in place and the connections and we should be letting you kind of, you know, work with the people you know and, uh, you know, find the strongest kind of uh, way to move the program forward. So this is all good stuff. I'm going to move okay. on. Um, and, and we're getting, like I said, we're, we're taking notes and I'll, let me also think about how to get that for like the, the RFI. And once we see that, maybe that'll be helpful to see what we need to address as kind of a group, as a region, as like the MMAC, what we need to, you know, push forward. So, uh, everyone understands that this is uh this is how states run you know or this is somehow how some of this kind of the your perspective so i'm going to move Susan, on from I, the, I, oh sorry go ahead question, if i can ask real quickly so we had a question from somebody um listening in will there be investments in circularity infrastructure and what would so i would assume yes but i don't know what that means and what uh, you know, what would that mean to this person? Because I, I guess in general, it's it's investments in infrastructure, uh, but what is it? it? Again, it's through certain entities, um, but what would, what you know, what would they like to see funded? Because that's, I think that's very important for us to know. Like what's the, you know, that's what I, what's kind of what we're asking is like, what is it that's missing? So I, I can put in the chat the, um, the, on, don't you have a link somewhere online for people to provide comments? I can put that in the chat. Yeah, there's a, like I said, the RFI is not out yet, but there's, you could get on the, the mailing list and they are really great about um, sending out information on a regular basis, especially I think that will be of, of note. So um, I'm not sure. I, I can keep moving on or I could, uh, I'm not Ernie, let me, like I said, tell me when, kick me off. <laughs> Uh, so we have you on till 11, Susan, but we, if oh, people, okay. a lot of good discussion in here. We do have two topics at the end that we can skip to give us an extra 20 minutes, as long as Rob Ryder doesn't mind sticking around past his. I'm here. That's the long part of the day. Okay. Thanks, Rob. So continue. Or Go on to okay. Or if people are, are ready to move on, you know, you, you guys let me know. But um, so I think we talked a little bit about the, again, how to address disadvantaged communities. Um, oh, I, I see Jennifer's question. I'll, I'll put that in the chat. Okay. And that that's, um, that's actually at the end of the presentation and I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, so I'm going to move on from this disadvantaged communities. This goes still kind of being defined. Um, just kind of how to increase access to uh, to certain communities that might not have it or to focus on those that are underserved. Um, so what data point or indicator are you using to measure success in your program, whether it's recycling kind of, um, I, I know there's businesses uh, and other entities on this call, um, because we're looking at what else is there to measure? What would you see as a positive measure towards success if you know you were awarded this these funds um, in addition to say tons collected or it's contamination decrease or in turn maybe education and outreach from your perspective what's a success for you is it uh, how many people put their bins out that day is it um again maybe decreasing contamination what is there any sort of points of success you think we should consider beyond uh you know for this grant program 
you know, these two grant programs beyond kind of those what those things we normally measure. If you have any comments on that. Susan, I'm always good for a comment. This is Mike Kinney again. We had okay. a discussion about what metrics worked and what metrics didn't work when we discussed the state solid waste management plan a number of years ago. And the problem became metrics are only good if you have something to compare them to. So to be able to say definitively what the metric for all programs or for each program should be is kind of a moving, wandering target. At least that's what we found. So the metric is whatever the local, whatever the grantee really uses as a comparative metric, what is their goal? I believe that that should be part of a grant program. Uh, you tell me what your goal is and how much you want to move the needle and how you're going to measure moving the needle. And they should be judged accordingly based on that. But if somebody says we don't have any past data, then there is no way to do that. And so maybe that says too, even just um, some of the some of the funding should consider how individuals, whether where at whatever level, can even collect data in the first place, because or kind of up their data game. I would say, I guess that's a that's what I'm hearing from you. Um, I think, but if not, that's a good. I think that's a really great point. Is like this, could, we have five years to implement this, so maybe we need to start some folks off at one point where they haven't even gotten before in terms of measurement. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and depending upon if you're measuring within a particular state, if you're looking to do measurements across the country, the issue there is that from, from state to state, you don't have the same definitions. So measurement from even state to state is going to be difficult. So I think you need to determine, you know, are you just going to measure each state internally to see how they've moved? Because trying to compare Ohio to California is going to be difficult because what is acceptable to be recycled is very different based on the definition. So I think that needs to be in, in your consideration of how you develop measurement, um, that needs to be considered. That's great, thanks. Which brings up an interesting point of whether or not you're talking about success of your program or success of the programs that you're funding. Because those metrics more than likely are two very distinct and not the same items. That's also a great point. I'm thinking because I, I know, you know, that's always baked into some of these grant programs, such as how are, you know, you have to talk about your outcomes and um, outputs, right? And so, and we want to see a lot of, po you know, as much positive change as soon as possible, it feels like to me. And so, what does that mean if California feels like they're going to like push the needle when they have different, they have different measures and different goals and different efforts compared to another state. So it's not, you know, states are so different. Just give us all California's money. We'll, we'll spend it more. <laughs> <laughs> let, let the record reflect that. Please. Susan, we have a comment here. Um, here, I'm just going to read it for you. So beyond the typical, I would suggest demonstration of the supply chain pathway. So if the grantee is diverting the material, follow the path demonstrating that material is recycled into a new product. Okay, thank you. That's an interesting one. Do you have some more questions there, Susan? Uh, no, I think that well for this one, this is this is because some questions on like I said the measurement and I'm not sure if if there's anything in particular about uh, the education and outreach side, but it's not this is all, um, you know this is all these are all great comments and thanks Dave for putting all the um, materials in the chat. That's helpful because I it's so hard to toggle back and forth when you are controlling the screen. So I'll move to the next question then. Um, so kind of a large, this is a big getting to the big picture. It could mean in Ohio, um, in your business area, your, you know, municipality, you know, kind of just what do you see as a, as an infrastructure and recycling issue? Um, these are big pictures. I think we've talked with our states already. Some say, you know, kind of, there's always been kind of a, there's been an issue recently about with collection, just not the 
not having enough uh, people working. Um, there's the issue of, uh, you know, facilities not being um, located close to, you know, just they're few and the facilities are few and far between. So those are some standard things. Is there anything else you'd like to bring up with us about what are some critical infrastructure needs um, or education outreach needs um, and how we might maybe how we'd address it or just what you've seen? We're interested in listening. This is Marcy Kress. I work with the environmental advocacy groups, uh, specifically the Ohio Organics Council. So I would just make sure to include Although the state of Ohio does strongly support the growth of infrastructure for organics diversion, but I think that should remain on the radar also. Food scraps, organics, yard waste, that is definitely a materials stream that um, could use some support for infrastructure. Thanks. All right, I can move uh, to the next one, the next question. And again, if something comes up and you're like, you wanna uh, you know, call or email me, that always works. Uh, I think what is missing from recycling education in, again, I use your area generally as like either your, um, your uh, geographic area or kind of your area of expertise or your business. Uh, what do you think is missing? Um, who needs to know what? And how, um, you know, I, I guess it's interesting because I know you we were talking about that earlier, the anti-contamination uh, group. Is there anything, yeah, is there anything you feel like is missing that would be important to communicate with us? In the education and outreach. This is Marcy again. I'm sorry to go back to an issue, but I, I have just found internally, I'm um, also work for a solid waste district. The data process of gathering education outreach is often something that has to be taught to entities to monitor this. So there's definitely certain certain pieces you can gather on outreach, but I know um, it is something we have had to learn here as a district. So just being clear on what the expectations are for tracking this would be a suggestion. Thanks, yeah, no, I th that's helpful. covers the model potential tonnages of what is generated. There's not enough infrastructure capacity. So more MERC processing capacity is needed, more convenient collection, additional composting infrastructure, et cetera. All right, the whole thing. All right, <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> Susan, this, I, uh, yeah. this is Steve Sargent, uh, private sector uh, representative. Um, with some history here in the state, it seems like education, we can put education out there, but the issue is, is a measurement is the, the success of that. And I think from the private sector perspective, we measure it, one, in participation. How are we doing? Are we, are we educating the consumer to get involved in recycling, number one? Number two, are they looking at the education and taking it to use? So what's our contamination? So I think it goes back to another point that was made. You, we need some measurements to measure the success of education. Or are we just throwing these dollars out there and we're not getting a payback for that? So at some point from the beginning of a program, we need to begin to measure that so you can look at it as a funding source to say, hey, that's been effective. That, that money's gone to good use. Um, the other question I've got to just off the note, is this a matching grant program? So the state would put up a match that maybe was that mentioned earlier? Uh, no, I, I don't know anything about matching. I, I'm not aware of that. I don't, at least from the competitive side, I don't believe that's part, that is not part of it. Um, but I don't know okay. from the non-competitive side what that will look like. Um, so. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, I, I see there's another comment. I'm not sure if you have to read those or I, I can read it as well. And I'm kind of taking, uh, I know we're taking some notes. Okay. Okay, um, and then also if there's any, any um, examples of education outreach programs that you feel have been uh, particularly successful in kind of something you've implemented or you're, you know, locally you feel like has been particularly successful. I'm not sure if that's, you know, that's kind of a tougher question for this group. So if, if not, if there is, you know, you could drop it in the chat and I'd love to look at it 
uh, or we could talk about it, but um, that might be beyond the scope here. That's um, it's Kimberly McConville, private sector. Um, I think we have great examples on curbside and hopefully soon drop off contamination remediation projects, all led by a combination of our solid waste districts and the recycling partnership. So we actually have some really good metrics on those programs. So in terms of E&O, I think um, scalability would become important and maybe some dollars for more intentional works in other um, areas of the state. Ohio's a big state. Yeah, that's interesting. I've had a lot of folks talk about the recycling partnership and how they've used their different um, materials to you know, move, move the programs along. Points we should consider that haven't been captured or additional challenges and resources you'd like to identify. I think this has been interesting, though, from a governmental perspective. You guys have really talked about some of the issues in, in terms of the structure and how we how the funds will eventually be distributed. So that, I think, definitely falls under this. Uh, but if there's anything else, kind of speak now. Um, Susan, I, this is Mike Panini again. I, I think one of the fundamental questions that might need to be asked is one that the Ohio grant program asked a long time ago from an infrastructure perspective, and that was, are we funding things in perpetuity or are we funding things that can be proven to make their own way in life mm -hmm. after the funding is over? Um, so even with your education and outreach, if you put a metric together that says that we can prove we're going to save this much money, so it it incentivizes you to continue that education and outreach on your own based on the seed funding that's been provided on a continual basis, um, that's something that could be looked at. Um, but I think that fundamental question of what are we funding? Are we funding something that is self-sustaining or are we funding something that is not self-sustaining, that needs to and be continued. Yeah, and I think that's interesting. Do you have a something, a comment on how you would continue, make something self-sustaining beyond funding? I, I, Which I know funding is like always the key, right? So I don't wanna pretend like that's not the biggest issue, but is there any other way you could, you think that there could be the motivation to keep something self-sustaining that we should know? This is, that I represent the solid waste districts in the state. Um, to that point, you mentioned there need to be, you know, more MERVs, more capacity for processing. You know, we need to look beyond that. You can gather all you want, you can process all you want, but if you do not have reliable or, you know, evolving end markets for these products, it's to no avail. So I, I think there needs to, to really be a look at um, and, and this is to the point of sustainability or even the circularity point is you need we need to develop these markets for you know whether it's it's you know polypropylene or whatever it may be you know we have a variety of other plastics that we, we you know we all look at each other and go what do we do with these things you know so um, you know I think we need to to look at more market development which is you know where we can funnel those things. And I, I think we need to look at those, although we are an international market, you know, community or industry, you know, the best place to start to look at those is, you know, here at home. So I think we need to look at that, not just the gathering and not just the processing. Yeah. yeah. So we, we have a question from a guest. Um, how do you track recycled items? So does something like incineration equal recycling for measurement? I I would believe not. Like um, I generally we kind of don't consider. I, I mean, it's going to be based on, I think, on what the organization is doing, but I don't think that waste energy is necessarily uh, that that wouldn't be. I, I'm not sure how to say it. Uh, it's not necessarily part of kind of the the recycling strategy and kind of a focus of
I know that the, some some states do, you know, consider waste energy maybe part of that. We do in Ohio. So okay. Uh, we have a waste diversion goal, not a waste recycling goal. So volume reduction due yeah. to things like incineration, composting would count towards the recyc waste reduction recycling rate. So, you know, if we were talking about trying to compare measurement from one state to another, we would have to subtract that from our our accounting. But fortunately, we don't get much of it. There's very little of it that's reported. So there's not much included in our rate. Okay. Okay. But this is all yeah, I see all these comments. Thank you for the, the comments. Uh, I'm going to take that with with us, too. So I'm going to go to the final slides just again, just a wrap up. Um, thanks for letting me talk a little bit over and thank you, everybody, for all your your comments. Those are all, you know, very helpful. And let me, you know, letting me speak here today. Uh, so what we're doing is, like I said, we're going to get all these um, comments, put it together, kind of consider how this can, you know, make this, a, these grant programs better and um, how they can work best for, uh, for everybody. Also, this is a five-year process. So kind of, you know, this is hopefully evolves and changes based on kind of what the work, what work is done and what folks like you have said, and uh, we'll finalize the grant programs. They should be open sometime in the fall. Um, again, the, the, um, the it's getting to the uh, sign up on the listserv is is a, in the email list is great. Um, and I think that they've been really putting out a lot of emails from headquarters to get the word out about different things going on. There's more information about these programs and there's some um, additional emphasis on batteries and battery recycling at uh, the I'll drop it in the the by far bipartisan infrastructure law, which is not what we're calling it anymore, but they have a great fact sheet on some of the things that are happening um, from the headquarters office. So that's all I have. Uh, if you you know want any want feel. So, and just so Matt knows, uh, we're going to invite Susan to our next Solid Waste Management District work group also so that she can talk to them to get their input as well. If, if, Matt, if nobody else has questions for Susan, Susan, thank you so much for coming on. Um, we will hopefully be keeping in touch with you as this goes through and we'll keep Matt updated in terms of what our involvement is too. Yeah, thank you so much. So next up on our agenda, we have Rob Ryder, who's the coordinator from the one of the two six county solid waste districts we have. His is down in southeastern Ohio. Rob is one of the last old timers and he is retiring soon. And so we thought it would be interesting to have Rob give you a perspective from somebody who's been here for quite a while. Um, I yeah, can you did you have it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. I'd like to say that I'm one of the last old dogs. <laughs> I think Carol Phillips is probably, Carol Phillips and I are about in the same ballpark. Carol does Kishock and Fairfield Licking Prairie District. But I've had 30 years at this, five years as a director of environmental health. And honestly, I'm tired. <laughs> You can see that it is a six county district. It's probably an eighth or a ninth of the land mass of the state of Ohio as far as acreage. Uh, we actually have to do special waste collection events in each of the district's six counties, and we do four a year for each of the six counties, 24 total. Started to drop off as far as all event or medium event, now large events are expensive, but we decided in the last solid waste management plan to stretch those to every two years. Uh, the special waste collection events has been. Uh, hampered since 2019 and I know that 
there were several waste districts that hired in contractors and and took their own people out and ran special collections. But I thought that was personally, having come from a, from a health department background, that that was kind of counterproductive to the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, okay, everybody's got a mask on. Everybody went home. The kids have even come home out of the schools. So we're out here. We've got a thousand people drive through here a day. I have to hire outside labor. I have to hire outside contractors that are coming probably from an area that has a high level of contagion. Thus, that just didn't make any sense in my way of thinking. So you know, we, shut them, we shut everything down for two years except for a household hazardous waste collection. And that was essentially at the end of the first pandemic cycle when the statistics dropped to you know, a decent level. As you can see, I mean, years ago, just a few years ago, we used to, uh, all the electronics we collected, I mean, TVs, computers, copiers, printers, big machines. Uh, we shipped those all to Mesquite, Texas, where they were dismantled. We had, we didn't have one penny of charge in it. And we did that for about five years. That company went broke. So now we're back to, uh, back to looking at things on an economic basis. Next slide. If you kind of look at this, we have 166 political subdivisions. 47 cities and villages, 113 townships, six counties, 113 schools, a state correctional facility. And there's only 235,000 people, and that's counting the inmates. <laughs> uh, yeah, 6,200 square, or 3,000, I'm sorry, that was a, that was a misnomer on me, 3,200 square miles. Uh, I work for a board of directors that is 18 members. So six counties, three per county. My policy committee, as is the other six county district, consists of 43 members. I got to feed those guys caviar <laughs> to get them to <laughs> me. <laughs> but, you know, all of it being said, I would rather be the director of a six county solid waste management district than I would have the largest solid waste management district in the state of Ohio with all of the money that I could possibly spend because you're under a different kind of microscope that way. We only hold quarterly board of directors meetings. In the middle of them, I know my place in that world and I do not get out of place. I know what I can spend. I know what I can spend it on. And if I have a major expenditure, then I call up the executive board, tell them what I, go, what I want to spend it on, what I'm going to purchase, what I'm going to repair. And I typically get three yes votes. We've built three transfer stations and all those transfer stations move is recyclables. This is the largest transfer station. As you can see to the left top corner, that is a, uh, the road into a bulk oil terminal, river terminal for oil. Uh, we own practically everything in green that you see from about 50 feet on the right side of that road coming in path up to the top of the hill above that transfer station. Uh, everything is external. It's a transfer compactor. We use ejector type trailers that are just like packer trucks, except the blade runs 45 feet in. So the trailers are pretty heavy but we don't encounter winter problems like uh, people do with walking floors. Go ahead, Ernie. 
That is a close-up of it, as you can see. There's a semi-trailer with a truck attached to it. This is an 80-foot conveyor. This is a wind barrier. Trucks back up and eject directly into the conveyor. And it goes up into the compactor and directly into the trailer. We can unload a truck in five minutes, a packer truck or a roll-off truck. And we didn't have to build a building to do it. It has you know, 40 foot scale because we only take in, you know, roll off trucks and packer trucks. I'm going to say I probably have six or seven push out trailers overall. Nine, yeah, probably. Yeah, six or seven. That facility has a glass bunker where we take in green glass, which is a hard commodity to move. And uh, then we also have van trailers. Uh, all the power is underground. Uh, there are no, no inclined or, or pole held wires. Everything is underground. I think if I'm kind of looking around right. We had about a $650,000 initial projection to, to construct that to the first level, to the minimal level. I've probably got closer to a million in it now, just, you know, and that's not a bad price to build a transfer station that can, we could actually push through 6 trailers an hour. If it ever became necessary, it's not necessary. We do run through about 250 tons a month, and as materials become lighter and lighter, uh, you know, it seems like almost everything we ship is plastic. Very little newsprint. Newspapers that were once an inch thick are now an eighth of an inch thick. So, especially in our area. I picked one of the local papers up yesterday because when the, when my daughter plays softball and they should be in it. I think it was four pages long. There were more grocery store ads than there was <laughs> actual newspaper. And I'm talking sports. <laughs> this is a transfer station at Neville County. I know it's a little bit hard to discern. This is an office building, a multi uh, office facility. We have offices in it. Human services, uh, soil and water, water companies, but the transfer station sits here. It has a compactor that is side loaded instead of coming over the tail. This one's side loaded and is packed into 60 cubic yard roll off boxes. We have a company that we don't do any of our own trailer for roll off box transportation because. Just because of a matter of efficiency, uh, we contract all that out. Uh, you know, you look at a, a highway tractor that was purchased in 2015 for about $145,000. Now, it was a heavy spec kid board, but in a big engine. Today, that truck on the lot cost around $260. For a hundred and forty-five thousand dollar truck, I mean, it's just it's insane the cost of trucks, and the cost of maintenance is even worse, especially if you have drivers driving the trucks. Then you are suspect to you know, abuse and negligence. This is a transfer station in Muskingum County. Everything you see in that photo. In the center of that photo is transfer station. This building has a uh, horizontal automatic baler in it. This is a transfer compactor and a semi trailer here because we ship everything out of those three facilities 
about 5,000 tons a year that comes into us. All of it goes to Ronke's facility in Columbus. We pay about $35 a ton. We have about roughly 40 and sometimes, well, it used to be well below 40, but we have 40 to $45 a ton free in that. And I have no idea where, you know, where that's going to go for us because it just keeps getting more expensive by the need for freight. These are the ejector trailers that we use at that facility. You can see on the front end, there's a bunch of hydraulic lines. In the inside, those hydraulic lines are valves, and that one's a 38 foot. It's got a 38 foot six stage hydraulic cylinder in it. Uh, there's a list of the collections we do. It's uh, and we list them by type, household hazard, waste, the dates in all six of the counties, scrap tire collections, dates in all six, and locations in all six of the counties, uh, electronics collections, and appliance collections, uh, the dates and locations in all six of the counties. And there's one of our haulers. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Recyclables are you know collected from the uh, lo different locations. I think we have probably close to sixty uh, drop-off locations. Uh, some are permanent. Uh, some are temporary. Uh, we also are able to take you know. Uh, Recyclables to Kimball Companies Transfer Station in Cambridge, Ohio. And we have the three bottom ones. Uh, so almost everything, I'd say everything in, in Guernsey County goes to Kimball's because we get a really good rate. And the companies that use the transfer stations, we have a lumpy consolidated companies that brings material in from that they collect in Washington County. They have two curbside programs, one in Belpre and one in uh, Mario City. Waste management brings what they collect in Washington, Ohio, Washington County, Ohio, and Wood County, West Virginia. Theirs is typically uh, all commercial and industrial. A lot of cardboard. Kimball companies used to bring us a lot of material, but they, since they built their transfer station at West Lake, they've uh, since internally integrated all that. Uh, Bucky Disposal, that operates in Guernsey and Northern Noble, brings us what they get, and, uh, and some of that is uh, school recycling, where they place 20 cubic yard roll up boxes with their employers. Then we have a tremendous amount of small businesses self all to us. None of the facilities that we own are open to the public and it's a liability thing. A theft thing. All of our facilities have uh, closed circuit camera systems that I can sit here in, in this room and log into all the cameras on, on these facilities. This is probably one of my best babies. This is Noble Correctional to Department of Rehabilitation and Correction Food Waste Composting Operation within the penitentiary. This was the first internal digesters for food waste. These were the first two that were ever shipped to the United States from Sweden. The, the district got the grant funding from, you know, I don't know who you were at the time, Chet, but it could have been the uh, NR. These are each uh, capable of. Uh, these are 240 models. I think they're capable of 
you know, 2,400 pounds of the 240 pounds of, of food waste a day. As you can see, both of those are set up. They're inside the education building within the penitentiary. It's where all of the prisons, classrooms, their wood shops, all of that sits. The thing, the digesters were bought in Sweden. As you can see, these are airflow pipes that pull the air off the digesters and into a biofilter that I had. Actually, the inmates build out stainless steel inside the penitentiary. They ordered the steel too thick. They ordered it quarter inch, and by the time we got everything welded together, you couldn't even screw it the floor. <laughs> but you see, what what our funding mechanism is a two dollar contract fee with about forty seven landfills and transfer stations in Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. As part of that contractual fee. We also receive the data back on the waste and types of waste that those facilities receive. That also includes oil and gas waste. The area that I'm in, in western Pennsylvania, northeastern West Virginia, are shale drilling companies. Utica and Marcellus Shale abundant in that area. So there were times that we probably took in two times as much money on oil and gas waste as we took in on waste. Our current balance, fund balance is about $2,800,000. Our annual budget runs about a million three. And the funny part about all this is the day that I took this job, I had they had $68,000 in the bank. And I think our ain't going to test for that. Now they're sitting on $2.8 million. I am ultra conservative, even though it looks like I've blown a lot of money. <laughs> the thing about it is where the necessity comes is with such a small population that Waste haulers don't want to go out and readily offer recycling services unless they have a reliable and economical way to get rid of those recyclables. And, and transporting recyclables in a packer truck, dumping them out on the ground, putting them in another vehicle, larger vehicle, and moving them another 180 or 100 miles is not an economical method. And we operate the transfer stations and we charge back the waste companies that bring material into us. Out. So if I, you know, I've had this belief for a lot of years, and now it's starting to bear more fruit, but that if we didn't offer it and we didn't subsidize it, it would never be feasible for any one uh, waste management company to, to justify building a facility for no more than they would take in as a solitary operation. And generally, waste companies don't play well together. So as the government is kind of a middleman building, controlling, subsidizing, you know, the operational end of it, all the R&M at the facility, power bills, you know, labor, uh, you know, we need all that. But it keeps the economy of scale down for recycling in that waste district. And that's all I care about is that we can offer economical recycling to cities, villages, townships, counties, whatever. But that is that is essentially the premise of all of this uh, transfer station you're building on. That's not easily 
readable, but that is the 2022 budget. I think for the uh, transfer stations, our expenditures got 1.24, 1.241 million is essentially $400,000. So it's a third of the budget. Payroll, all of that amounts to about 160. And even though this waste district is rather large, fairly complex, there are only two full-time employees that work for the waste district, myself and I have a secretary that does it both here. That is why I work nice and weekend. <laughs> Go ahead. Honey. You can see here that yeah, the uh, we those entities. Uh, city is. Operated a waste collection system within the city. But we still set the specifications up for their for their bids every five years. Thank God. I think I've got all of these guys rolled over to five year renewals on their contracts. None of these are charter cities, so they yeah, they're required to rebid every five years. And uh, and it's a blessing that they're all they flipped over to five year contracts and rebid them in the fourth year. And I'm blessed to know that none of them expire until next July. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do waste audits on you know industries, businesses, institutions, which are you know it could be schools, uh, government operations, penitentiaries, those kind of things. Colgate Palmolive's manufacturing plant in Cambridge is a monster. They even produce their own sulfuric acid to make their cleaners with at that plant out of molten sulfur. Solve advanced materials, uh, which is uh, everything from baby bottles to uh, the material from baby bottles to uh, uh, healthcare plastics. Molly Bearings Plant, which makes all of the engine bearings for most of the major automakers, or did at one time. Uh, Meba, which is also at that site, and Meba Center. Meba makes heavy locomotive engine bearings, and uh, Mo Molly Center is owned by, I believe, the Austrians, uh, and it is a, they take in powder, powdered ferrous iron, and they produce bearings, sprockets, and all of that for the automotive industry. It is an amazing process to see something, see powder go into a process through presses, heat treating and come out on the other end so hard that you couldn't break it up with a sledgehammer. It is, it is literally an amazing process. Gold bearing that used to be in McConnell's Reel, they were a foil bearing manufacturer. Double correctional way, you can see that you know, we've, you know, we've done our job there uh, with the uh, comp, uh, food waste composting operation. And I think that proliferated But I know I laid out the blueprint for the process of the process that went into the kitchen. It's called a process or a pulp or extractor. What that machine would do was take all of the food waste from the cafeteria and food operations, run it through a shredder, up, a, up a, an inclined screw push out 75% of the water of the water waste that was in that material. So if I put a pound in, 
I would only end up with a quarter of a pound to send to the composters. And I think some of the younger facilities didn't do it because the less water you've got in the, in the process, the less bulking the agent you have to have. And these operations use wood pellets, just like wood stoke pellets. So, and I know I'm probably the time you get. Uh, you get it. You got Here we go. 42 <laughs> month update, and here's some of my complaints. And I know that you y'all can make recommendations to the state legislature, whether they change or not. Well, that's anybody's guess. But 42 month updates to district solid waste management plans are not necessary. The only benefit is for consultants to literally write the same plan three times in a 15 year period. And do you realize that districts like mine that have limited income and could use $150,000 to do $100,000 to $150,000 to do good things with? Uh, there are 15 year plans, which are not actually 15 year plans. And I'm sure Ernie and his crew could. There are a myriad of things, information collection, statistic collection. We're always feeding this section statistical and financial data all year long. And yeah, yeah, I'm sure that you know the state of Ohio and its infinite wisdom didn't have a clue how to deal with solid waste districts during a COVID pandemic. Uh, other government entities, like I said before, all the rabbits went to the hole. <laughs> the waste districts personnel had to stay out. Am I? That's correct. That's right. Yeah. We had to stay out. We could, I mean, we have to have, I think the greatest thing that you could give us, even if you had to give it to us on a case by case basis, it's a little bit of flexibility to be able to react during you know, what I call natural disasters, pandemics, war, whatever. Uh, we need a little bit of a force majeure clause in the uh, in the uh, legislation to, to help these districts out. Because believe me, I'm leaving. <laughs> the 8th of July will be my last day. The 9th is my last payroll day. And I'm leaving. I don't care what happens next. I'm going hunting in Texas, probably Georgia or Carolina. And then in the fall, I'm going elk hunting in Colorado. So, uh, and I've got a daughter that's 14 years old that I'm 69, so I want to enjoy her. As I know, you know, I could go over and sit down beside Chet and be going. I'm fatally aware of that. But, you know, there, there are other things, and I think, you know, one of the toughest things that we have to look at is districts who have February 2nd, and we can't place the order to, until July. I had prices go up before I could have those last six trailers built yet. The price increased 50% from the original quote. And I think you're going to see that as pretty much a standard on all new equipment. I called Caterpillar about a new piece of equipment. He told, he told me, he said, hey, you can order, but it may take 12 to 15 months for you to get it. And you look at those kind of things, you're going, geez, you know, 
Well, I go buy used equipment when I've got used equipment. And, and, it, and it's definitely tough for all of us, you know, especially these scrap tire guys that are, I can say they're buying, you know, a lot of the heavy, heavy stuff that they're, ha- they're, they're having a rough time. One of my friends bought a brand new Chevy pickup that doesn't even have the chip in it to make the heated seats work. <laughs> because Chevrolet didn't have it. But, you know, and and if it had, you know, I, I look at fuel labor, my labor, fuel equipment, the prices have increased 50% since March of 2019. You know, a lot of us blamed on the pandemic. God, I'm tired of hearing that excuse. If I call people up to purchase anything and they go, well, it may take a couple of weeks because of the pandemic and I'm going because of COVID or whatever. I'm going, listen, dude, can you have that to me air freighted tomorrow morning? Well, you know, I go, hey, do you want me to buy it off of you or do you want me to buy it off of somebody else? I don't care. That'll usually get them to help to it. But over the years, I think I used to be a gentle person, didn't I, Chet? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just not that person anymore. You know, you come to a point in your life where your, where your age sort of compels you to do things that you don't ordinarily do. And one of them is wordsmith. I don't like to wordsmith anymore. I don't like dancing language where we, you know, banner back and forth. I don't like to do that anymore. I'm pretty plain spoken anymore, but I am still kind of diplomatic about things, aren't I, Ernie? Sure. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, people usually respect knowing where you stand and knowing that you're not going to flip-flop around, that you take a stance. And I'll be honest with you, there isn't any of these guys that work for EPA or have worked for EPA that we haven't had, what, objections to what one was doing or what the other one was doing, but we always met in the middle. We always, you know, at the end of that conversation, that day was over, we were still friends, we were still colleagues. And we knew that we would have to work together, or one of us would just go have to quit. <laughs> it looks like it's we. It looks like it's you. It looks like it's me now. I'm going to leave our EMP. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Rob, I know you're a short timer, and you've got a lot of animals to kill in a few weeks. So, and I'm joking. I'm a farm girl. I have no. I actually train German shepherds. I believe that. Working dog. I believe that. If a big bag of money fell on your solid waste district, where would you use it first? What's the most critical need? I would hate to say that, but I would hate to say where I would have to put it because with the limited amount of materials that that we produce in that district and believe me i've thought many times about building a central facility to process the material but that's limited by the amount of tonnage you can get i mean if we were to take in 20 tons a day and yeah 20 tons a day and and try to process it We'd go broke as a joke. I mean, we would we would end up subsidizing it to death when the equipment was, and would never be able to go, you know, come back to get the money to replace the equipment because ten years down the road, and I think maybe some of you have seen that at uh, Medina County's facility that you can't afford to go back in. <laughs> and I don't I don't think I want a big bag of money. What about bringing curbside to your district? And Pardon? again, I'm from Coshocton County, so I'm very rural. Curbside. Would it ever work in your district? I have curbside Marietta. 
Belfry, Zanesville, and a few other smaller villages that are that are all run except for Zanesville by privately or publicly held companies. And I'm not talking about the government only. Uh, I Zanesville's the only you know public entity that operates our own system, but believe me, I've butted heads with literally every big mayor in that district. They talk about it, they campaign on it, but they don't mean it. And I think EPA, Beth, you know what I'm talking about. Man, they'll talk a good story during the election. And I hope there aren't any politicians offended that are sitting on this, but so be it. Chat's a politician. Huh? We've already been offended. <laughs> but there, you get something not that you just can't crack. You can't, Cambridge. And you try to sell them. I mean, over the years, I've tried to sell them on not only cost, because the cost would literally come down by half per month. Infrastructure. Uh, your streets have got one truck on them collecting garbage one day a week. And... One truck collecting recyclables. You got two trucks, you know, maybe three, but they never run the same street. You're taking four or five trucks off of each street in that city. How long can you afford to keep paving, paving streets, rebricking streets? And and they they understand the point, but they just and I've had better guys than me in there trying to sell. And the citizens want it. They, they want it. They want it. Yeah, and, and there's another thing. There are probably four or five haulers that run in there, one major, and two, two smaller companies. They're afraid that they'll put the smaller companies out of business. I keep yeah. saying, hey, this is America. A computer die. I mean, you know what? It's not like playing softball, is it, Ernie? <laughs> you're either on the field or you're off. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but so, Rob, what is your your last thought? Because I knew Ernie's probably looking at me. We got ten minutes. We got ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Really? I won't take it all up. I'm, I'm happy if you take it so I don't have to do my presentation. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, you know, as far as that money bag, if I took it, I probably wouldn't change what exists. The only thing that I could possibly do it is build a central facility to maybe collect appliances, electronics, and hazardous waste. But that in in and of itself is those were all very expensive propositions. Hey Rob, if if you did have a bag of money that fell in your lap and you did decide to do a, a MER, would would you ever consider being regional to take more than just from your district? Oh yeah, you it? would you would have there's to no be. processing capacity. And that's the thing. Like I mean way. I guess the other thing that you know I thought about on the way up this morning that I haven't mentioned is the fact that when these districts were formed, so disposal facilities were supposed to be big regional 10,000 ton, 15,000 ton a day monsters. We got landfills coming out the wazoo in the state. Of I've got contracts with 47 of them all the way from Johnstown out to Pennsylvania. The Nitro, West Virginia, down through I-79, across, up to Toledo, and literally every facility in the state of Ohio that we have contracts with that collect fees for us, and it may so, at some point in time take waste from us. And these are, the bulk of them are with major waste companies. But never in my life could I have imagined 
that the recycling was going to be a regional thing, and that's what it is now. You've got one facility in Neville Island, Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh. You've got a facility in Columbus. I think you have one in Cincinnati that is regional to that point. Campbell. You've got Kimball that have, that operate two, one in Canton, which is small, one in Westlake, which is large. And I mean, oh, I'm sorry, Akron, Waste Management in Akron. You've got five regional recycling facilities up against 47, you know, 40 landfills in the state of Ohio. Think about that. I'm not, well, I know Rocky plans to build a 40 or $50 million facility or somewhere in there. Get the Joyce campus. campus I over can, yeah. Anyway, uh, that takes a lot of guts because I don't know of any of these guys that probably have over fifth, the big ones would be 15 to 20 million. At this point in time, they're going to go with a tremendous amount of automation in that facility. I, that's the only thing I'm coming back to the waste for is I want to see that when when Bill Billy Rumpy opens that thing up to the to the to the world, I want to see it because I I can't imagine what a forty million or fifty million dollar facility would even look like operationally, but. God bless them. Any other questions? You said that the system was set up for regional landfill perspective. I hear when I hear that that it's set up wrong. Pardon? I hear when I when I hear that I, I think to myself it's set up wrong. Okay, we set this system up with the intention of having this be re the result. You've been involved in it in 30 years. You kind of mentioned what was set up wrong in the 42 month rather than the 15 year plan, yeah. but it's really not a 15 year plan. Mine essentially don't really evolve much, do they? The problem, Ernie, the probably the last three or four plans that, that we've updated, I mean, we haven't done anything revolutionary in this plan. Well, and I guess my question is, my question is, if you were to break the system, and had to redo it again, what would you do? I would probably make 15 year fit plans, 15 year plans. There would be a mechanism between Ohio EPA and the districts to be able to make changes inside those plans. And that would be as far as funding and programmatic. That would be the number one change. The number two change would be that you know, our initial fear was running out of landfill capacity. Got out, they brought you know, <laughs> what that big cat out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was the that was the impetus from the federal government behind House Bill 592. And I gotta be honest with you, Joe Seekers, Joe was on my board of directors after he Retired from uh, Ashland Chemical. Joe was a lobbyist and then went back to Guernsey County where he was raised to be a county commissioner. He was on my board of directors. One of the best guys and one of the sharpest guys I ever met in my life. But, yeah, you know, I've got to give them a, you know, a tremendous amount of, I guess, kudos for the fact that they wrote a plan that have been on statistics that have been fed to them by the feds. And I hate to say this, but you can obviously say this day and time, you will have a lot of trust in the federal government, <laughs> especially to tell you the truth on a daily basis. I've lost that, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, the feds forced the impetus toward regional disposal because of, they thought there were disposal issues. We didn't have disposal issues. 
we had recycling issues. And it evolved very slowly over the past 20 to 30, 15 to 30 years, it's evolved really slowly. But it should have evolved much more quickly, I, I do believe. And, and, and I got, I mean, and I'm going to give, you know, the guys that, Chet, who was at DNR first, and then in the Grants Division and over in uh, over at EPA. If it wasn't for those guys, we wouldn't build what we have there. The only facility I think I built, I built two of those facilities without a drop of grant money. Built them out of budget. Uh, the one in in Washington County. That was built with, with grant money from, from Ohio EPA. A lot of it. Now it's, I've, I've dumped a lot more in it than I got in grant money. But you know, I always feel that those were worthwhile projects and that I think we just got to look at House Bill 592 and everything was promulgated from it in a different light than we initially took it. We would like to do that too, and we made that effort years ago, and it got, it got stomped out. So you know, yeah. you got to get somebody. It, it's not a sexy topic anymore, and so yeah. But I think you know, I that's that's the best conclusion that I believe we can ever come to is the fact that you allow us to work together to allow these solid waste management plans to flex a little bit. Because you can't write a pandemic into a solid waste management plan. I wouldn't even know how to write it in today because I know we're still in it, supposedly. But, and it was nice to come here this morning and not see anybody wear a mask. It's nice they don't. <laughs> Thank you, Art. We really appreciate you sharing, Welcome, sharing your experience with us and for coming all this way. This I want to thank all of you for having me out. I mean, I've over the years I've done a little, a lot of presentations, but yeah, this feels good. I'm on my way out. I, you know, I can't really quit until I'm done. But uh, but it's been a pleasure. I'm glad you invited me. Gave me the time to speak. Thank By the way, I much. usually have a. A big old German Shepherd ride with me every day, everywhere I go. Behaved, which, you know, is a little disappointing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Rob or the German Shepherd? <laughs> Both. <laughs> uh, um, it's time, down. yeah. It's 12.02. Um, with that, and respectful of everyone's time, uh, we have two other subjects here, but we'll push those to the next agenda or the next uh, the next meeting. Um, unless anybody has any other comments, questions, concerns, or things that they want to see on the next agenda, I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Make a move. Second. Second. All opposed. Aye. <laughs> Motion carries. Have a great day. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating.